Well, hi there, everyone. Welcome to Dome at Home. I'm your host, Scott Young, planetarium astronomer at the Manitoba Museum. And we're really excited to be back for another great uh, astronomy show. We're uh, broadcasting live from an undisclosed location, trying to stay warm in this incredibly clear and incredibly frosty sky. With me as always is Mike, and he'll be monitoring the chat, answering some questions and things like that. Mike, how are you doing today? Burr. Yeah. Uh, that's all I got. I'm sorry. I, I got nothing more. That's it. Hey, okay. Well, very good. Uh, we got people uh, already checking in. You know the drill. Thank you. Let us know where you're listening from. Let us know how many folks are with you. Sure, drop the temperature in there too, because uh, that way you will, uh, you know, it's not a competition. We're all in the same kind of boat right now, but um, yeah. Um, someone I just saw go by in the chat, the panelists. The panelists are me and Mike and uh, the um, everyone else, the attendees is everyone else. There's a thing that Mike has just dropped into the chat there. We do allow sort of an open chat during the program. So if you have questions, um, if you don't see the chat uh, window, just move your mouse around. All the options will pop up at the bottom of your screen and you can click on chat. Just, uh, yeah, say hi. Let us know where you're watching. Oh, lots of uh, familiar names going by. Nice to see you. Yeah, minus 27 here in Winnipeg, where we're broadcasting from. Um, we do try and keep the chat, uh, you know, family friendly and, uh, and kind of focused. If you ask a question and we just don't get to it right away, um, it may be because we're saving it up for the end of the show where we're going to do sort of questions that are maybe a little bit off the beaten path or, or not relevant to what we're doing right now. But... Uh, yeah, I think we can pretty much just get back to our our uh, our lineup here. Um, we had uh, a number of different things uh, come in over the last couple of weeks or so. One of the things that we love is when you send us email, drop us a message. We've been getting pictures of people's work. Someone, uh, you know, if you've been following along with the hands-on activities, there's stuff there that you can do. We've been... Uh, seeing pictures of people taking pictures of the sky. We had got some great sun dog pictures in that we showed uh, last week around, which was awesome. We will be uh, looking at a few other things as well um, later on in the show. So uh, if you wanna see your, your work up on, the, up on the big screen here, just send it in to us. You can uh, see the various links um, that Mike will drop into the chat a few times. We'll put them up on the screen. And uh, from email, you can always just remember space at manitobamuseum.ca. That's, uh, that's the best way to get a hold of us. All right, on with the show. We always like to start uh, every show with sort of an acknowledgement to uh, kind of the patron saint of astronomy communication in Canada, Dr. Helen Sawyer Hogg. Brilliant scientist, brilliant researcher, amazing science communicator, brought the stars to the public for 50 years. The stars belong to everyone. And so the, the goal of this show is to help you um, get to know your stars. The stars that are out there, are, they belong to you and me and everyone. So let's, uh, let's get you familiar and uh, acquainted so that you're not strangers anymore. So this has actually been a pretty good week. Um, we, uh, we got some great images in. This, is, uh, this was sent to us by one of our listeners. This is uh, Annette that uh, did her solar system model. If you recall, we, uh, we made some scale models of the solar system a few weeks back. You can see those on the, on the reruns if you wanna check that out. Um, it looks like she took my advice and, and did uh, the, the inner planets at one scale and then the outer planets at a different scale so that they wouldn't be ridiculously big. Um, really nice job, great job, Annette. Thanks for sending this in. And uh, she was using uh, air dry clay, I think for this and doing some paints, so. Really nice, and it's uh, it's been great to see some of the images that have come in from from various folks. Oops, went a little bit too far there. Oh, we have some announcements to make. Um, let's see. I, I did want to say hi to uh, to Lander, who sent us some mail over the the course of the uh, week. Uh, my friend Charity and uh, Keith and Sarah Furtani, watching from Minnesota, and uh, their parents are watching from in Manitoba here. So nice to know that we're bringing folks together to. Uh, to be able to do this during the sort of safe at home period. This whole program is brought to us by the, the, uh, the province of Manitoba's safe at home program. And uh, this is, astronomy is a great thing to be doing while you're, while you're waiting for, you know, 
all of the things to reopen and all of the things to sort of go back to a, a bit of normal. I also wanted to say um, happy birthday to Declan. Declan is turning nine today. So congratulations on starting your the, the beginning of your 10th orbit around the sun starting today, right now. You've got another, uh, what is it, about nine... Almost, uh, almost a billion kilometers to go for the rest of your, your orbit around the sun. So better get running. Happy birthday, Declan. Okay, let us move to the night sky. We'll, uh, we're using our program called Stellarium here. This is free software that you can download and um, make your own little desktop planetarium. The sky doesn't change all that much week to week in terms of where the constellations are. So if you remember where things were last week, if you have gone outside and you haven't lost your fingers and toes to the frostbite, um, things will be roughly in the same spot. There's only a few changes that have really been, been going on. We're pretty much near new moon right now. And so there's not a lot of moonlight in the sky. So this is actually a really good time. If you do have the ability to get out of the city and you know for sure that your car is not gonna, you know, stall on you or something like that so you won't get trapped out there. Um, this is a good time to be out of the city and get a nice good look at the stars. Off in the north we still have our you know the big dipper. Oops the north star is not quite visible there. Let's just make a little adjustment. There we go. Big dipper, north star, Draco the dragon. Pretty much the same spot that we've seen them for the last little while. The the changes are off in the east here. If we look off towards the east, we're actually getting new constellations coming up. And so the constellations of winter that we've been seeing uh, have moved high up into the south, but the new ones are coming and they're spring constellations. So for me, this is awesome. When I see the backwards question mark here, the sickle it's called of Leo the lion, I know that spring is coming. And for me, that's that's huge. So this is Leo and uh, it's rising in the east right around right around now, seven o'clock or so. The, uh, the other constellation up here that's kind of, it's made of faint stars, it's called Cancer the Crab. It's another one of the zodiac constellations. It's quite faint, a little bit harder to see. And then up above it, we have Gemini the twins. Gemini is going to be our feature in Connect the Dots a little bit later on. And so we'll get to Gemini, but uh, some nice bright stars there. In the south, we of course have Orion the Hunter. We spent a bunch of time with Orion over the last couple of weeks. The two or the three stars in his belt, Betelgeuse up here in his, uh, in his shoulder and Rigel down here. Now you can start to see the brightest star in the sky fairly early in the evening. It's not in Orion, but we use Orion to sort of find it. If you look at the belt of Orion, these three stars sort of if you, they kind of draw a line, not a perfect line, but pretty good. And they sort of go down in this direction to the brightest star in the entire sky. Anything brighter than this is going to be a planet or the sun or the moon. This is the star Sirius. It is often called the dog star because it's part of a constellation called Canis Major. But Sirius is the one that really jumps out at people. We often get a lot of people calling at this time of the year saying, hey, there's this star that's low in the Southeast and it's flashing all these colors, red and blue and green and stuff like that. What is that? Is that a planet? Well, no, it's, it's the star Sirius. When the, the light from a star comes through the Earth's atmosphere, there's all the heat waves, there's all the distortions and things like that. And basically it gets broken into little rainbow images that dance around. And that, that's basically what we call twinkling when the stars are sort of twinkling back and forth, that's what's happening. Sirius is bright enough that its little twinkling images can trigger the color receptors in our eyes and we can actually see the red and the blue and the green. It can be really, really beautiful, especially if you're looking like I do right over my neighbor's house and right through the chimney stack where all the heat's coming out of their furnace. It really makes Sirius dance around really nicely. So if you can line that up, that's a, that's a way to sort of simulate that. Um, so yeah, Sirius is, um, is definitely an interesting star to look for. And uh, it's now finally high enough up in the evening that we can see it uh, pretty well. Over in the West, we're saying goodbye to the constellations of autumn. You can still see the great square of Pegasus, which is these four stars here and a trail of uh, stars down below it. Again, it's supposed to be a flying horse 
At this time of the year, it's standing up on its head. Again, we don't worry too much about those things. Um, so um, those stars, they're, fa they're fairly faint and they're starting to get lower and lower. So definitely, uh, definitely a challenge to start to see those. Uh, I'm seeing some questions go by here. Uh, the North Star is, is over in the north. And so it's, it's not quite straight up. It's, uh, it's above the northern horizon. And you can use the Big Dipper over here to find the North Star. These, uh, these two stars point right to it. Um, which Dipper is my favorite? The Big Dipper, because it's nice and bright and easy to see. Um, can we still see Gemini? Yes, we're going to be seeing Gemini um, very well. And we are going to check out the um, constellation Gemini in detail. It's got some really interesting stars that uh, we'll get in there. Um, and Lysia is talking about who's watching the Perseverance rover. Yes, this is this is the time of Mars, basically. If you uh, if you want to think about it, Mars is up there in the sky. In fact, it's it didn't quite show up here in our map, but it's high up in the south. If you if you look high in the south, there's Orion. It's way over here. It's actually quite far from us right now. It's about 200 million kilometers away long enough that any radio signal from Earth takes about 11 minutes to get there. And so these spacecraft that are there, they're pretty much on their own. And if you were driving a car and you had an 11 minute delay between you seeing something in front of you and you turning the steering wheel, it would not work out. That's basically what the rovers are doing. They are um, pretty much autonomous. And we'll be checking in with those rovers um, and the spacecraft that just got there the last couple of days uh, in the show as well. Okay. Let me just uh, advance my highly technical script here. If you do go outside constellation wise, you have to be very careful. It is very cold. Make sure that you're um, doing so safely. It's best to go with someone else. Best to go to a place where you can warm up, things like that. Don't get caught outside because uh, it is a dangerous level of cold right now. This is the time that a lot of people are asking, can I observe through my window? Well, even if you like, just your eyes, uh, for sure. If you have binoculars or a telescope, you might find that looking through a, a piece of window glass is going to give you some distortions, but you know what? It's way better than freezing your fingers off. So go for it. Um, any kind of observing of the sky is great. I, I used to turn off the living room lights when I was a kid and just look out through the, the picture window in the living room with my binoculars. And I had a great, great old time. Sure, I could have had a better view if I was outside, but it's not worth it with the cold. Okay, so um, we are going to move on to our connect the dots segment, which is uh, sort of our constellation of the week. Essentially, we feature one constellation that we can get into a little bit more in detail. And this week, it is Gemini the twins. So who's a Gemini out there? Who knows if they're a Gemini or not? You know, horoscopes, birthdays, all that kind of stuff. We're not going to worry too much about that aspect of things. But I do have to say, you know, one twelfth of the world pretty much knows Gemini because it's their horoscope sign or their sun sign or whatever. That connection with the sky, that's great. Go out and look for your constellation. Right now, Gemini is really well placed in the sky. It's over in the southeast uh, sky. It's up nice and high. You don't have to wait um, too long to see it. And it is made of some really nice bright stars. It kind of, it kind of looks like. Um, I don't know, it looks like a coffin to me, kind of like, I, I don't know, when I was a kid, I was into vampires. So it kind of looks like a, a coffin shape with sort of like, uh, I don't know, it's maybe it's not more of a, just a box, I guess. The, uh, the lines, if you draw them together, we're using the H.A. Ray um, constellation drawings, as one of our viewers suggested last time, kind of looks like two stick people with their arms around each other. Gemini is called the twins. And they're, they're kind of named after these two bright stars that, are, that mark the heads of the twins. So Castor and Pollux in Greek mythology were two brothers, well, half brothers. They had the same mother. Um, one of them, the, the father was the king of Sparta. And the other one um, was Zeus, because if you know your Greek mythology, that's kind of a Zeus thing. So Despite this, these brothers were best of friends, but because, um, let's see, which one was it? It was um, Castor was mortal, 
and Pollux was the uh, was the immortal one because his father was Zeus. So they were great friends for years and years and years. And then finally, of course, um, Castor grew old and died. And his brother was so heartbroken, he beseeched his father to, um, you know, give him give his brother immortality. And so the compromise that Zeus reached was to take both of them and stick them up there in the sky where they would be seen forever. Um, it's kind of one of those things that um, we're not sure where that legend started. We do know that Gemini was in a star catalog put together by Ptolemy in uh, the second century AD. And we do know that in um, Babylonian times, the two stars, Castor and Pollux, were known as the great twins, although they didn't have that same kind of myth associated with them. They were just called the twins because those two stars are nice and close together and they are to the eye they're pretty much the same brightness. So they kind of look like twins. It makes sense. In the last, you know, 20 centuries or so, we've actually been able to look at those stars in a little bit more detail though. And so um, we actually know quite a bit about the two stars, Castor and Pollux, and they are nothing at all like what you'd expect. First of all, let's start with Castor. Castor is sort of the top one of the two. Castor is actually not a star. It is six stars, all in orbit around each other. There are actually two bright stars that you can see in a telescope right next to each other. If, in a good telescope, you can see the two of them. But each of those is actually a pair of stars, a big white star, and then a tiny red dwarf that's very close to it that we can't even see from Earth. We can only tell that it's there by analyzing the starlight and things like that. So there's those four, and then there's another pair of red dwarfs that orbit each other that orbit around the two other stars. So you've got this six star system all orbiting around. Imagine if you were on a planet that was in this system. Would like, first of all, would you go around one of the stars or, or two of them or, or all of them? Like, how would that work? You probably wouldn't have nighttime. There'd always be a sun in your sky somewhere you wouldn't know about the other stars. It would always be daytime. It's just kind of crazy. Um, we don't know if there are planets in that system. It's maybe a little unlikely because with all the gravity of all those stars moving around, planets would have a hard time staying you know, in a stable orbit for too long. But so when you look at Castor, try and you know think of it. It's, it's not just a dot. It's not a thing like the sun. It is this complicated gravitational dance of six stars. Pollux is a giant star. It's a star that has about twice as much mass as the sun, but it's about nine times the diameter. So it's basically a, a giant star. Um, it's, it's very much like what our sun will start to turn into in around four billion years or so. I think we talked uh, last week about the, the life cycles of stars and how Eventually, stars like the sun, they swell up and become red giants. Well, this one hasn't quite gotten red yet, but is basically heading into that giant stage. And it is only a single star, though. Um, so that's Pollux. Interestingly, um, for a while, they thought it might be a double star or there's something going on there. Just recently, they've confirmed that there is a planet in orbit around Pollux. So if, if you've ever heard about these exoplanets or these planets around other stars, well, there's one around one of the bright winter stars that you can see with your eye. You can, you can look at that star, Pollux, and know that there's at least one planet going around it. It's a Jupiter-sized planet that is, um, it's about uh, one and a half times as far away from its star than Earth is from our star. So it's kind of, you know, like it's like a big Jupiter that's a little bit close in. I'm not sure what else is going to be found in that system, if we might find smaller planets or not, but... Uh, it's not that far away. Pollux is, uh, Pollux is like 33 light years away. That's pretty close. I mean, if we sent a radio signal there, it would only take 33 years to get there. And then if there was someone to reply, it would take 33 years to get back. That's not so bad compared to some of the other distances we've been talking about. Okay. Uh, Scott, can I just quickly interrupt? Uh, someone Absolutely. was asking uh, on the previous, previous image of the sun that you, or the star that you had up there, what were those dark spots? Oh, excellent question. Okay. Um, the most stars are not completely um, uniform. I mean, they look really, really bright, 
but there's often sort of light spots and dark spots where which are areas of different temperatures where it's where it's bright it's a little hotter where it's dark it's a little colder and um, our sun has them as well we call them sun spots spots on the sun poetic name hey but basically those are places on the sun where there is a little bit of a, a you know a few hundred degrees cooler temperature so they look dark compared to the the brightness of the sun interestingly the more sunspots there are the more activity that the the star is actually undergoing and so if you if you can look at a star and see how many sunspots it is it gives you a sense of sort of what's going on inside which is which is kind of neat and actually we'll tie we'll we'll come back to that right at the end of the show so that that's uh, actually a really um, fortuitous question okay if you have been looking at the sky uh, if you either go to a place where it's nice and dark, or if you have a pair of binoculars, I mean, or a small telescope, but a pair of binoculars is, is plenty. There's a little bit of a, a treat in the constellation of Gemini. So you've got the two bright stars at the head, you've got these stick figures here, um, and their legs are sort of splayed all over the place. This part over here, this leg here on um, Castor's leg sort of you know, it looks like he's got a leg and then this leg is longer for whatever reason, this little train of stars here. Just off to the side of that train of stars, right in that sort of region, is a beautiful little star cluster. It goes by the poetic name of M35. It's, it's the 35th catal or cataloged object in uh, a catalog put together by Charles Messier in the 1700s um, uh, that we call the Messier catalog. So it's, it's kind of like the the greatest hits of the sky if you're looking with binoculars or a telescope. So if you do have binoculars, take a look in that spot and you'll actually see this beautiful cluster of stars here. And if you are looking in a telescope, there's an another even smaller star cluster just off to the side. So the, the, uh, the main star cluster is something like 3,800 light years away. And then this, this other one off in the distance is like 9,000 light years away. So we are way off uh, in distance here. Even though it looks like it's close to um, Castor and Pollux, that star cluster is way off in the distance. Uh, we talked about star clusters uh, as sort of part of the life cycle of stars in terms of um, how stars are formed or things like that. Actually, we got into detail um, quite a bit in the last episode. So if you want to catch up on that, the episode five had a whole sequence on how star clusters are made and how they sort of fit in with all that. So this star cluster is basically like the Pleiades star cluster that we see, except way farther away. So we can't see it as, as good. We just see it as this tiny little cluster of stars. So Gemini, it's uh, got some bright stars in it, some interesting stars that we can sort of imagine as we look at them. There's a nice little star cluster and so on. Um, it was also the site where back in 1781, um, the planet Uranus was discovered, just happened to be in the constellation of Gemini. That's actually why Gemini is a zodiac constellation. The planets move through. Uh, right now, there are no planets in Gemini, but uh, if we wait long enough, eventually a planet will sort of cruise through that part of the sky. So Mike, do we have other questions uh, that are sort of related to what we're talking about here? Things are going by so fast on the chat here, I just can't keep up. Yeah, there, there are lots of questions. And I just want to remind our, our participants on Zoom that uh, we're trying to focus on the questions that are relevant to what uh, we're talking about in tonight's topic. So there is one good question that I think uh, so at least one person wants to know, and I think others might as well. Uh, can someone's telescope see M35? Absolutely. Um, in fact, if, if I was to make a, a list of things that would be good to look at with a telescope, M35 would be near the top of the list, probably like number six or number seven after the, you know, the, the moon and the planets and the Orion Nebula. It's a beautiful little star cluster. There's, there's a couple of hundred tiny little fragments of diamond dust on velvet is kind of what it looks like when you look in through a telescope, especially on a nice dark night. Um, there, um, I think we've talked about the book Night Watch. Um, and actually the star maps that you can download from our Dome at Home site uh, has a location of where that is. So you'll be able to sort of see where it is and where to put your telescope. Um, all right, we do have, uh, we will do some sort of broader questions at the end of the show. So if, uh, if you, we didn't get to your question right now, 
ask them again when we get towards the end and we'll, uh, we'll get there. I know that this is, you know, the universe, it's a big topic. People have a lot of questions. Okay, we're gonna talk about Mars. Um, I have to say this is super exciting because uh, going to the planets is really hard. And, you know, sending a robot spacecraft all the way to Mars to go into orbit or to land or things like that. It's been tried a whole bunch of times. Only about half of them have been successful throughout all of human history. There's been like, I don't know, 35 attempts and only about half of them have made it. So we had three that were launched in July from Earth um, and two of them have arrived and so far everything's working well. I think my favorite one is this one. This is the Al Amal spacecraft launched by the United Arab Emirates. It's their very first interplanetary probe. And about 10 years ago, they sort of said, you know, we're going to, we're going to start doing science and we're going to use it to inspire the people in our country. And they went into a, very, a big um, push to get a lot of young people involved in science, particularly uh, young women. Um, over a third of the uh, the workforce on this mission uh, is uh, is young women working on the on the project, and it's you know it's a big risk. And so we were watching on uh, on Wednesday as the probe was going in, and they were they were all watching live. And as you can imagine, it's it, it's a bunch of uh, you know scientists all watching the screen and and sort of biting their nails and so on. And then they all burst out clapping and jumping up and down and stuff like that. It was, uh, it was awesome. So uh, El Amal, um, which means hope in Arabic, is now in orbit around the red planet. We haven't got any pictures back yet. These are animations and, uh, and images of the actual spacecraft. But basically, it's about, I don't know, it's kind of like the size of a washer dryer. That's sort of a standard orbiter kind of thing. It's got some solar panels and a big satellite dish to talk to Earth. And then it's got cameras and all sorts of scientific instruments. And, and its its job is to basically study the atmosphere of Mars and to sort of understand how the atmosphere has changed and what's in it and all that kind of stuff. So it's a pretty bold mission, especially for a first uh, first attempt from a, from a, a country that's new to space. Um, so let's... Uh, Oh, let's hope that hope does uh, lives up to its name and uh, and send some good stuff back in the next little while. So it was launched in July. It's it's now uh, captured in orbit around Mars, and they'll be refining that orbit so they can have it go in nice and close, and um, be able to deal with um, you know getting nice close pictures and so on. Okay. Mike, there's a chat thing to look at and you're probably working on that already. Um, here's the second one. This is the Tianwen-1 spacecraft from China. This is probably the coolest picture that's been taken in the last little while because they, they have this scientific spacecraft going to Mars. It's an orbiter, a lander, and a rover, which has never been done before. It's probably the most adma advanced Mars spacecraft ever. And what's happened is they didn't just put all that stuff on there. They put a tiny little satellite on it that is basically nothing more than a selfie cam. And when it was on the way to Mars, they shot this thing out the side just so it could fly off into space and look back and take a selfie of the spacecraft. We never get to see the spacecraft from inside or from, from outside because all the cameras are on the spacecraft, right? So this is actually pretty cool. Up on top here, you've got um, the big rounded arrow shell, which is basically, this is where the lander is inside this and there's a heat shield there. So this is the part that's gonna pop off and then land on the planet. This is the orbiter where it's got the, the communications dishes and the solar panels and stuff like that. So, so this arrived mere hours after Al Hamao. Um, it was, it wasn't quite a race. We knew that they were going to come in this order, but it was very, very close in terms of when it, uh, when it came in. And so the Chinese probe is also in orbit. The lander doesn't go down yet. It's they, they actually go into orbit and then they stay in orbit and, and figure out where they want to land for sure. Um, 
So the landing will probably happen in May is what the plan is now. And that will be the main, um, the main thrust of sort of their, their effort then. The, the lander will land, the rover will go off and start doing some experiments and there's all sorts of cool things happening. So yeah, a three piece mission, which is, is really ambitious. And uh, I'm really excited to see this one going as well. We do have one more spacecraft that is on the way and it will arrive uh, uh, next week, just before our next show. I think it's three o'clock in the afternoon on February the 18th. That is the Perseverance rover. rover. It's uh, launched by NASA and it doesn't go into orbit. It just basically plummets straight down to the surface of Mars, um, goes through what the NASA calls seven minutes of terror, which is basically the, re the entry into the atmosphere, the big heat shield, the, the surviving of the, of the flames and the heat, the parachute, the retro rockets, and then a sky crane that will lower the rover down to the surface. Super complicated, super crazy. It worked for the Curiosity rover a few years back. So I have hopes that it will work for this. Um, and it's a really exciting mission as well. We'll be focusing on that mission next week because we will know for sure that it has landed successfully next week. And so we'll get into more detail then on exactly what's going on there. But all of these probes are really trying to answer that, that question. What was Mars like in the past? Was there ever life there? And we're not just asking because we want to know. We're asking because um, we want to know about planets. We live on a planet. So by studying Mars, it's like a second um, case study to look at. We can't just take the Earth and you know change a bunch of stuff and see what happens. Well, I mean, we shouldn't. Uh, I guess we kind of are, but we shouldn't do that because consequences can be pretty nasty. But by studying Mars, by studying Venus, by studying Europa out by Jupiter, we can learn all this stuff about planets in general. So really, really um, exciting science. Okay, uh, do we have any questions on Mars that have come by, Mike? Any of the uh, questions or comments that you wanna share? Uh, nothing that I've uh, seen so far about Mars. Um, yeah, Facebook is also fairly quiet about uh, Mars. So yeah, I think you can keep going. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, pretty much you can see all of this stuff happen live all over the internet. So people are, are sort of getting to follow along and things like that. It's, it's really exciting to see, um, you know, that you get to watch live. Um, oh, Ryan just asked, why is Mars so red? Well, uh, basically it's rusty. All the rocks contain iron and there used to be a lot of water there, which caused the iron to rust. Now the water's all gone. We don't know where it went, but the rust is still there. And so that's essentially what the outer surface of the planet is. Um, Cal was asking about, do these probes get close enough to collide? Well, Mars is about half the size of the earth. So it's, you know, it's a pretty big area. And uh, it doesn't have nearly as many satellites around it as the Earth does. So there's really not much danger of collision. Um, they, they do sort of coordinate with the other people just to make sure nobody's, you know, trying to go to exactly the same place at the same time. Partly for safety, but mostly because if someone's already been there and taken those pictures and looked at those rocks, you kind of want to go somewhere else to get new information. So we're not going to worry too much about that. Uh, Cindy was saying, is there... Are they going to come back to Earth? Well, you know, this none of these probes are designed to come back to Earth. But for some reason, the Perseverance rover is going to pick up some samples, drill into the ground, put them in tubes, and save them so that a future mission could come there and pick them up and bring them back to Earth. I'm not sure why they're doing that, to be quite honest. I mean, if you're going to build a whole nother mission that's gonna to go to, to Mars, land next to this spacecraft, have an arm on it that can reach over and grab the samples and then put them in and then blast back off and come to earth. Why don't you just get the samples then? Why don't you just land somewhere, pick up the samples then, and then come back to earth? It kind of makes no sense to me. I mean, I guess it means sure you get samples from this particular place, but you, then you have to send another spacecraft to this particular place. It, it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense why they've chosen to do that. Um, but I'm sure that there is some reason. Maybe it's, just, maybe it's just the promise of the idea that we could come back for them. And so 
we will come back for them. I think there's always the sense that, is this going to be the last mission for a while? Will there be not enough money? Will there be political changes? Will there there'll be all these kinds of things? I mean, NASA gets a fraction of the, like way less than 1% of the American budget. And most other countries, it's the same kind of thing. So it's not like um, they have a lot of money and it's not like, you know, other things are not getting done because of NASA, but there's always this sense that, you know, that might, that might happen. Oh, Kirthen has a, uh, Kirthen has a, a, a point here. Uh, the reason that NASA plans to store samples is because they want to store samples that are uncontaminated by earth materials as possible. So that if somehow earth organic material gets there on some other mission, we will have the pristine samples that Perseverance collected. That's really interesting. Um, I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, now that, now that many countries are sending probes to Mars, you're going to get more and more material from going from there. And if you land on Mars, well, what if bacteria hitched a ride or whatever? Sure. If you're looking for life, but you brought life with you because your spacecraft was dirty and then you find life, well, that's, that's not very exciting. So yeah, that's a, that's a valid point. Okay. Thank you very much for, uh, for filling that in. I, I never quite made that connection, but uh, it does make sense to keep these, these um, pristine samples, you know, away from other kinds of, of contamination. I love this community. Okay. So we have Mars. Um, we will be following along with Perseverance next, uh, next week. There's going to be um, live stuff happening beginning about 1.15 Manitoba time, that's Central Standard Time, uh, live through NASA. Um, they have all sorts of stuff. And then we will be on uh, next Thursday at seven o'clock and we will basically bring you the highlight reel and, uh, and get into you know, everything that's, that's happened. So if you don't have time to watch the whole thing live, join us next week at seven and we'll absolutely be there for, uh, for that. Okay, let's see here. We'll move on to our next sort of segment here. One of the things that we, we try and do repeatedly is to have, you know, some opportunity for hands-on experiments, activities. We know a lot of folks are, you know, either doing homeschooling or home learning or they're isolated at home or whatever and are looking for fun stuff to do. And whenever there's a landing like this, people are people are usually impressed with the idea that, you know, landing on a planet is fairly difficult. Well, you can simulate a Mars landing or a moon landing yourself, with just basic materials. So one of the things that, I, I guess this is, this is kind of a challenge to you folks, but if you're, if you're interested in trying this, build your own Mars lander, build something that can take a pilot, this egg, well, not this egg specifically, but an egg from your fridge. Work with your parents, please. Um, and you can build something that can have this egg survive being thrown up into the air and then coming to crash down. That would be like the simulation of the seven minutes of terror coming in towards to land on a planet. So what do you do to keep this egg pilot safe? Do you... I don't know, I got a little Pringles container here. Maybe that'll be the, the cockpit, but he sort of rolls around in there. I'll need some padding. Maybe I'll put a parachute on that. Maybe I'll put some balloons on that. They used airbags on some of the moon landers or the, uh, the Mars landers in the past. What can you do to, to sort of make a, an egg pilot survive a landing like that? If you Google um, egg lander, you will find a whole bunch of suggestions and activities and even some plans on exactly what you could do to make that work. But we would love to see you take an egg, build something to help it survive, and then throw it up into the air and have it survive. And you can send us videos or pictures. That would be, uh, that would be pretty cool. It's a great project, especially if you're in doing like the grade six solar system um, a cluster. That's, uh, that's got a whole bunch of great stuff there. You can follow us on, uh, on the Facebook or YouTube, or you can drop us an email if you want to get us videos that way. We'd love to see some of these videos or, or some pictures of the, uh, the activities that you've been able to do and work on. All right. Let's see here. 
we have uh, a little bit of time that we can talk about some of the questions that people had before. I saw a bunch of stuff going through. I saw um, a lot of people asking questions that, uh, that I couldn't quite get to then. What, uh, what would you like to know? What, what questions do you folks have about exploring the solar system or exploring space or looking at the night sky or, or anything? Let's see what you got. Scott, I'm going to jump in here. I've got a question yeah. from Facebook that I think uh, is really good question. Uh, Evelyn has asked, what color was Mars before it was red? Oh, that's a great question. I have never been asked that question before. Um, so we don't know for sure, of course, because none of us were there. We suspect that for a big period of time, Mars was blue like the Earth is blue because it had oceans of water. So we think that it was a blue planet for a while. Before that, it probably went through the same kinds of stages that the Earth did, where it was sort of um, gray rocks and, and black um, volcanoes and things like that. We're not sure what happened with Mars's early atmosphere, if it had the same kind of volcanic activity that uh, that earth did so there might have been periods where you couldn't see the surface because it was all covered with these thick clouds and smog and stuff like that but i, I imagine it was sort of a, like a, a grayish kind of uh, bedrock and then the water and then the rust so that's probably the sequence what a great question uh okay let's see lots of uh lots of other questions coming in here um we think mars was probably about 50 percent covered by water ryan um it may have had continents like the earth but mars is too small for its core to have a lot of heat in it you know here on the earth we have the continental drift the plates move around the continents move and and over long periods of time, we had continents crash into each other and move apart and stuff like that. That didn't really happen on Mars. It's just too small to have that kind of internal heat to drive that. And so basically what we have is you could take Mars today and pour water into it and it would just fill up all the low areas and the, the parts that were you know st still sticking out, that would be the, the continent. And it would be pretty much a half and half of the planet. One half of the planet is is pretty low lying and the other half has got where all the mountains and things like that are. So great question. Um, let's see. Uh, what do we have here? When, when is the thing landing on Mars? Uh, that's Thursday. The 18th is the landing of the perseverance Rover. And then the Chinese Rover will land sometime in May and they probably won't tell us in advance. They tend to announce successes rather than announce when things are going to happen. They, they focus very internally on the way they do their missions. Um, rather than sort of doing it live on TV. Um, Malcolm says, when do you think people will be able to go to Mars? When I was a kid, a long time ago, um, they were saying, oh, 25, 30 years, people will be walking on Mars. Today, 25, 30 years, people will be walking on Mars. It's not that we don't have the technology or the ability to go, we just haven't really decided to go. I mean, it would take probably 20 years of, of solid effort to go from, you know, where we are now to building the rockets and the spacecraft and being able to take enough food and being able to do everything you need to do and going to Mars. But you can't start it and then stop it. You can't start it and not give it enough money to do it. You have to decide you're going to do it. And the thing is, it will take longer then any politician will be in office. Like the American presidents can only be in for eight years. So if it doesn't happen in eight years, they don't get the credit for it. So it hasn't essentially happened. That's literally one of the reasons. I think though, that with all the private companies that are starting to get into space and you've got folks like Elon Musk who wants to take a million people to Mars in five years. Yeah, he's, I'll tell you a secret. He's kind of crazy, but he's the good crazy because he's the person that is sort of saying, this is, this is what we could do. He doesn't know how to do it necessarily. And it doesn't happen as fast as he wants it to, but he's pushing. And I think that's in some ways um, pretty helpful because it makes the, the slower space agencies like NASA and the European space agency and so on have to sort of compete a little bit. So we'll have to see. I, I, 
be surprised though if it was anytime soon. In fact, I'll be surprised if we have humans back on the moon by 2024, which is the current NASA plan. I think that'll get pushed off a few years as well, just based on cost and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. The Americans have a few things to deal with right now. And um, I don't think NASA is necessarily the highest, um, the highest priority. However, I did find out that um, the new president, uh, Joe Biden, asked for one of the NASA moon rocks to be brought to the, to the Oval Office. So he's got a moon rock in his office. So hopefully that means he likes space. So we'll have to see what happens. Um, there's a couple of questions back and forth. Uh, about uh, life in space, living forms in space, all that kind of stuff. Um, so here's, here's the basics. We know that there is life on the earth. Some will argue that there's even intelligent life on the earth. Uh, the proof is you know, questionable at some times. But all we know for sure is that there is life on the earth. And then we have little pieces of evidence that suggests that there might be life from other places. There, you've got everything from um, there was water on Mars. Maybe there were uh, they thought they found some fossils on Mars, but that turned out not to be the case. We've got life that could exist in environments like Mars, living here on Earth. Um, and then you've got things like people say that they've been, you know, kidnapped by aliens. And then you've got people that have seen things in the sky and stuff like that, and perhaps they're alien spacecraft. None of those, unfortunately, give us the answer. Um, if an alien was to land, you know, and walk up to the United Nations or somebody like that, take me to your leader kind of thing, sure, then I'll take that evidence. But until then, if it's just someone's story, unfortunately, there's lots of reasons that people could see lights in the sky that don't necessarily mean that they were aliens. So I'd love to say that there's proof of life out there, but there is no proof. However, it's almost inconceivable that there isn't some kind of life out there somewhere. Because if you've ever had to clean the fridge, you know, life grows everywhere, like wherever you want to, wherever there's any kind of environment that is, is not totally toxic, life will grow there, you'll get mold growing, or you'll get algae in your fish tank, or you'll get little shrimps living down at the bottom of the ocean by a uh, vent that's pouring out hydrochloric acid in a volcanic vent. I mean, really nasty places, life can still exist there. So why wouldn't it be out there somewhere? I just do not think that those people, those, those forms of life are advanced enough to be building spaceships to come flying here. So, and that doesn't even get into the whole thing about distance and so on. So I'm pretty sure there's life out there, but the evidence still to be found. Um, we do have a, let's see, a couple of other questions. Um, oh, something about uh, when the stars, when the stars go down. So when we're looking at the sky, and let me just go back to our sky here, and we'll just turn on the fast forward, essentially. When we're looking at the sky, things in the sky appear to move. You know, the sun rises and sets, the stars slowly move and so on. Um, all of that is because we live on a planet, the Earth, and the planet is round and it spins around. And so all of us right now are being carried towards the eastern horizon at about, well, if you're here in Manitoba, it's about 700 kilometers an hour. If you're at the equator, it's more like a thousand kilometers an hour. Um, that's fact, that's, that's truth. And because we're moving as the Earth rotates, when we look out in the sky, we see the stars moving the other way. It's, it's like the mirror image. And so when those stars spin around and when the earth spins around, so you're facing away from those stars, you can't see them because the ground's in the way. So basically the whole sky cycles around, it looks like, uh, and all that's caused by the earth rotating. So basically those stars are visible from the other side of the earth at that point, but they're not visible from us. And that cycle has been you know, observed for thousands of years. That was our first clock, our first calendar. So lots of really good stuff there. Um, Mike, do you have any other questions there? I just, uh, I, I'm looking here and I just got a, a little red box here that says 99 new messages. So I, I, I don't know where we are. Uh, no, yeah, you're right. The questions have been flying past, but you have answered quite a few of them about Mars. 
Uh, the, they touched on a few that have, people have had on Facebook and even a couple that we've had on YouTube. So thank you to our YouTube viewers who are uh, participating as well. Uh, but I think you pretty much got all the good ones there. I just want to remind everybody that, of course, we've got previous episodes of Dome at Home. Uh, a lot of people asking about things about star lives. Uh, and of course, we covered that in episode five. So I definitely encourage you to check out our previous episodes on YouTube. Uh, in order to see, uh, get some of your questions answered there. Yeah, great. That's right. We have, uh, we have a bunch of, um, all these programs are archived and there are downloadables and activities and all sorts of other things that you can access as well uh, through our Dome at Home website, which is part of the museum's uh, website. And let's see, we also have, come back here, there we go. We have, um, a bunch of things coming up for next week. Like I say, we're going to be um, recapping Perseverance. We're going to be uh, checking out one more Zodiac constellation in the sky. And we'll also be uh, hopefully showing off a few of the Mars lander uh, creations that some of you will make, uh, or even just some ideas here. Oh, we got, uh, we got some, oh, uh, something from Malcolm. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, um, I think I may have spoken to your guidance counselor um, that uh, she's bringing Dome at home in. And uh, oh, thanks, Ms. Murray, for being an awesome and engaging teacher. Uh, so that's Malcolm from uh, 6M classroom. And uh, yeah, for sure. I, I know that uh, a number of teachers are using these programs in their classes, and that's great. And uh, you can always just drop us a, an email, drop us a, uh, a line in terms of, um, oh, let me turn off the link there. There we go. Um, uh, direct message. Um, you can also tag me um, individually. I'm Scott the Skywatcher on Facebook. So if you have other questions, you can drop them through there. Thank you all for uh, attending. We'll be back next week with a new show. And uh, I hope that between now and then it will warm up enough that I can get out with the telescope and start taking a few pictures that we can share with you. Uh, it's always nice to be able to do some live telescope stuff as well. And so uh, click like on the Manitoba Museum's Facebook page and on the YouTube page, uh, join their email list uh, that uh, Mike is dropping into the thing into the chat and you'll find out when we're going to go live and do all these things. Thanks again for uh, attending everyone. We will see you again next week where um, we'll go back to Mars and we'll also explore the night sky. So thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful evening and I'll see you under the